Live from Case at 12, Good Morning San Antonio starts right now. Hi there, good morning. It is Tuesday, May 23rd. Happy Tuesday. Thanks for joining us. A little humid this morning, but I just stepped outside yeah. uh, right before the 10 o'clock. Not too bad overall. I'm going to take your word for it. Yes, I haven't been outside, outside since we walked in the door at 345 this morning. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, just shy of 9 o'clock, 76 degrees. So a slow warm up is in progress. Let's bring in Justin Horn. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Bright and sunny out there, just like your outfit, Steph. Aww, uh, that's, <laughs> that's the way it's looking today. We're going to see mostly sunny skies. We are going to watch what happens well to our north and west because we could see some of those storms creep down into our area a little bit later tonight. Let's look at some of the headlines and get you set for your day. Uh, first off, feels like it's going to be in the low 90s. Uh, those feels like numbers by this afternoon because there is quite a bit of humidity and temperatures will jump into the 80s. Yes, we're going to watch what happens in the Texas Panhandle. I know that seems kind of weird, but what develops up there could work its way down into South Texas later tonight. Our rain chances all in all are really very low though. And we're going to take a look at Guam. What's going on there? Well, there's a typhoon Mawar, and this is turning into a major typhoon. We're going to check in on that for you too. Coming up in just a little bit. 76 right now, partly cloudy. Dew point is at 69. That uh, number is up from where it was yesterday. And as we look at the pollen count, molds way down. This is great news. They were in the very high category yesterday, if you remember. This is a huge drop into the moderate category at 960. Grass is low at 10. Case that 12 hour forecast. 83 noontime. Look for a high around 88 this afternoon. Actually close to 89 by 5 o'clock. Mostly clear skies, and again, we'll start to add in some very, very small rain chances coming up later tonight. More on that entire forecast in just a bit, but let's check in on the tail end of the morning commute. Things are still looking good, I hope, Stephen. You know, Justin, we were keeping our fingers crossed here for a little while, but it does look like we still have some issues out there on the roadways. Let's just get you uh, to our trans guide cameras. So the commute for the most part, yeah, it's cooled down and you can see there at 37 at Houston. Not really a lot going on out there. Great shot of the Alamo Dome as well, but it looks like a spider there at 410 at Marbach. Look at that. Wow. OK, not impacting traffic, though. We'll get back to that spider in just a little bit, but nothing major is happening on the roadways from these shots at Transguide. Let's get you to what we were seeing earlier. A crash at US 90 eastbound at General McMullen Drive has already cleared out, so let's not worry about that anymore. Both those east and westbound lanes don't look too bad. Uh, Textile reports that this crash at 281 northbound near St. Mary Street has already cleared. However, what we are still seeing is some of the slowdown as you can pick it up right there. A lot of orange and yellow that's still taking place, but uh, one of the crashes that is still active is over here off of I-10. That's in the westbound lanes at UTSA Boulevard. This is not causing any issues for drivers. In fact, it's been pretty quiet there along I-10 for the last hour or so. But overall, the commute, yes, yeah, winding down just a bit, but we still have a few things that we're going to continue to keep a close eye on. You can see that some of the scattered construction remains in and around the Alamo City, but let's get it back to the Transguide cameras where we can see that traffic continues to move just okay at 35 at Pine. Still some slowdowns remain, but we're going to watch things very closely. And hey, if you want to Stay up to date on all things traffic. Scan the QR code. It's now on your screen. That takes you to our case at traffic page. We have a full list of the current closures and also have to throw this in there. A feature on there asking you what problem areas are you spotting in and around the Alamo City that needs some attention? There's a prompt there and you answer that question. We'll work to find you the solution. Guys, thank you, Stephen. Let's look at today's nine at nine. The mayor of Uvalde acknowledged the lingering questions about the delayed law enforcement response the day of the Robb Elementary shooting as we approach the one year mark. Don McLaughlin says officials are close to finalizing an agreement that would allow the city's investigator to access police records to determine if any officers should be disciplined. The former sheriff's deputy and school resource officer accused of standing back and failing to confront the gunman during the 2018 Parkland, Florida school massacre is preparing for his trial set to begin next week. Scott Peterson faces multiple counts of child neglect for not entering the building where the attack unfolded. Legal analysts says this is a first of its kind case, applying child neglect charges, viewing a school resource officer as a caregiver. A U-Haul truck crashes into barriers near the White House, causing a massive law enforcement response with some area businesses put on lockdown. The driver was detained and Secret Service now says this may have been an intentional act. The suspect is facing five charges, including assault with a dangerous weapon, destruction of federal property, and threatening to harm the president. 
A fake image spread quickly online yesterday, rattling stocks on Wall Street. That image showed smoke billowing near a white building, leading some to believe an explosion occurred near the Pentagon, when in fact no such incident took place. The incident appears to be an early lesson in the power of artificial intelligence. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell is scheduled to speak before the New Democrat Coalition luncheon today. It comes as leaders in Washington scramble to find a solution to prevent a potential national default. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has said that debt limit negotiations with President Biden have been, quote, productive, but they still haven't solved the debt limit dilemma. Years of inflation have taken their toll on our sense of financial security. A new survey from the Federal Reserve shows that 35% of us last year said we were worse off compared to the year before, the highest share in a decade. The percentage who said they're okay is down five points to 73%. Inflation peaked at a 40-year high last summer. According to S&P Global, more than 230 companies have filed for bankruptcy so far this year. High-profile retailers that have done so include Bed Bath & Beyond, Party City, Tuesday Morning, and David's Bridal. Analysts expect the default rate for companies with low credit quality to peak early next year. Rising interest rates also make it difficult for struggling companies to get new loans. TikTok is now suing over Montana's law that would ban the Chinese-owned video sharing app in the state. The company calls it a violation of free speech. State officials accuse TikTok of sharing information on American users with the Chinese government. Teens are getting a new way to pay. Venmo will officially offer kids as young as 13 the ability to sign up for their own accounts as long as they get their parents' permission. Parents will also get ways to monitor their teen spending. And that's today's Nine at Nine. In the morning headlines, we're taking a closer look at some of the many people who will be affected if the U.S. defaults on their debt payments in a couple of weeks. And confusion over those expiration, use by, sell by dates on food labels. Plus a western scene outside a northern city. And imagine finding a scary creature in your toilet, but just in time. So David Sears is here with all of these morning stories. They're going to see this and a lot of people are going to start checking the toilet. Every now and then. I imagine so. Before they put it into use. <laughs> you watch. We'll have that in just a second. First, we're going to start with this. As the deadline to reach a deal on the debt limit gets closer with no done deal, members of the military and civilian workers getting a little more nervous. So are the cities where they host military installations. If the U.S. defaults on its debt, that means government employees may not get paid. And that means it could not only hit families hard, but the cities that host those military bases could also feel the economic impact since service members are a big part of the local economy. So there is a lot riding on the deal to get done or a lot of folks are going to get hurt with so many military, former military and government employees here in San Antonio. Our city could feel some of that pain. Yesterday, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and President Biden met face to face, as we told you just a few minutes ago. They met for about an hour and a half. McCarthy came away from the meeting saying it was productive. The two sides still have a lot of work to do before there is a deal. Used by, best by, expiration date. Labels you see on food products, but what do they all mean? Apparently not the same thing. And now there is a call to change the way that food is labeled. We do know a massive amount of food is tossed every day because of confusion. The FDA Food and Drug Administration says between 30 and 40 percent of all the food in the U.S. is wasted. That adds up to about 400 pounds per year per person in the country. Food safety advocates and New Jersey Congressman Josh Gottheimer want to change that by changing the labeling system. The date labels on food products and we instantly get confused. More often than not, we throw it away because we fear we might get sick. You're telling me that a recently purchased rice or a bag of pretzels is dangerous to consume on that shelf date? Or how about your salt and pepper? You got to throw out the salt and pepper because suddenly someone came up with a random date on that? Gottheimer now leading a bipartisan effort to get the FDA to standardize expiration date terminology across the country. A tip from the FDA, don't rely just on those dates that you see on the labels. Look at the food even after the expiration date. Here's another tip for you. You can smell some of the food like milk. You don't need a date to know whether that milk has gone bad or not. You're on board a Michigan State Police Cruiser. There's a four-wheeler coming down the hill. And right next to that four-wheeler is a cow and then a cowboy. 
The cow is loose and it's headed to the highway. And there it goes, picks the middle lane. Cowboy in pursuit. Once again, this is not Texas, it's outside of Detroit. Cow heads for the median. Eventually jumps the guardrail. The cowboy eventually got him corralled back home safe and nobody got hurt. So imagine you have to go to the bathroom, you get to the toilet and whoa, <laughs> look what you find in the toilet. A hissing, scaly, nasty looking iguana. That toilet belongs to John Riddle. He walked in his bathroom just off the pool room and there it was. I thought, um, I was in Jurassic Park or something. He was uh, splashing and hissing at me. Eee. So John had to come up with an iguana removal game plan. He noticed the iguana went deeper into the toilet, so the first thing he did was get one of those baby gates so it wouldn't get into his bedroom. John waited for about an hour, came back, was trying to get the nerve to grab him, but the iguana eventually jumped out, got behind the toilet and hid for a little while. John got in to shoo him into the pool, so he hung out in the pool for a little quick dip, and then out the back door he went. The lesson is, John figured that he left the door open when he went to walk his dog. Mm -hmm. so now he knows that every time he walks his dog, he better close the door or have an unwanted guest All right, in the and, and if you're just watching David's story now, guess what state this was? All together now say Florida. Florida. Yes, yeah. it was. Yeah. Now, David, you shouldn't have to look down when you go on to take care of I, this kind well, of thing. Well, I will now, <laughs> every time. <laughs> just like, open, shut, open, shut. <laughs> But I think what David's saying is this is not exactly an open and shut case. No. Exactly. David, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Good news if you live in the city of Lytle. City officials have lifted the boil water notice that was issued this past weekend. Officials say the water is now safe to drink and cook with, so if we get any more information, we'll make sure to bring it to you. Yes, ma'am, we will. 909, 76 degrees, still ahead on GMSA at 9. Well, back in April, we told you about a robotic surgery program here in San Antonio, and now we're hearing from one of the first members of our community who received a robotic heart surgery. We're going to talk about how the process works and how this unique surgery has improved one woman's life. Plus... A school in Medina Valley is expanding their automotive program. We're taking you behind the scenes of that program and the hands-on training that is changing lives of students next. Just about 914, Medina Valley High School investing in automotive education and expanding its program. Tiffany Huertas joins us live in Castroville with how this program is giving students hands-on learning experience and other opportunities. Good morning, Tiffany. Good morning. It's a little loud in here, but it's a lot of fun. Just check it out. Students are hard at work. The automotive program here is growing. They're adding another teacher and class next school year. They had about 200 students this year, and they're expecting about 250 next year. This morning, we have Russell Alvarez, automotive teacher. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Great. Talk to us about this program and why are students so interested in it? So this program is pretty fun. We do a lot of uh, work on vehicles, everything from the very basics to advanced tuning. So what you can see here on this car, the students are tuning the uh, air fuel ratio on this car. What they're doing is trying to get the most power out of it using our dyno that the school has. Uh, what we do is we calibrate the air fuel ratios and we try to make the most power out of the, the engine that the car can make. So the students learn this type of stuff. This is tuning. Uh, we also have students working on air conditioning repair. We have uh, suspension and wheel alignments and engine repair. So they work on everything from learning how to take a tire off the car all the way to being able to rebuild the engine in this program. Uh, they get certified in ASC accreditation. Uh, we have a few students graduating as master technicians, uh, ASC master technicians. So it, it, there's a lot of stuff that we offer here at the school. We're also dual credit certified. So uh, next year, we're going to have our first batch of students graduate with their associate's degree and also being able to be master certified. So it's are you a, excited? It is. It's pretty exciting. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity these students have. We have a few students that graduated last year. They're already working for Toyota. Some of them are working at uh, other dealerships, at auto body repair shops, Navistar, uh, the diesel repair shops. So once they leave our program, they have a lot of opportunity to grow. 
and uh, expand their careers in. And South Texas is definitely growing in this industry. And we have two students joining us that really want to share what are your favorite parts of this program and what is your name? Uh, my name is Liliana Cortez and the favorite part of this program is being able to get hands-on experience and work on our cars. We definitely learn a lot and there, we, a lot of the stuff we learn, there's always something to learn. You never know anything here. <laughs> and your first and last name? Um, I am Benjamin Martin. And what's your favorite part about this program? Um, I really enjoy uh, being in a safe and supervised working environment and being able to um, learn and make mistakes um, that aren't too severe. <laughs> and you can definitely teach me a lot of things because I just step in here and there's so much to learn, but it's lots of fun. Thanks for joining us. We're going to hear more from other students coming up on the noon show, but we'll send it back to you. Sounds good. Thank you, Tiffany. Back outside with live cam, we bumped up another degree yeah, outside right now. Looks like hazy sunshine from this camera shot. Yeah, it's a little hazy yeah. out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. Uh, and we'll see some clouds off and on today, but, but not a lot. Uh, before we jump into our forecast, I want to take you out to the Pacific. Okay? okay, so we've got a typhoon that's headed towards Guam. And before we talk about it, I want to give you a little trivia question here. So Guam is home to the naval base Guam and which Air Force base to create Joint Region Marianas? I'm gonna take myself out of the running. You know. You I know. figured you knew. Mm -hmm. I don't. So is it uh, <laughs> Vandenberg, Hickam, Anderson, or Osan? Mm. What do you think? Uh, sure, Anderson sounds nice. You're right. It is, it's Anderson. <laughs> so uh, Anderson Air Force Base is located there on Guam in the village of, I believe it's Yago. So as we look at the tropical satellite here, and I take you out to Guam, uh, this is Typhoon Mawar. This is a big typhoon. Winds are at 155 miles per hour, gusting to 190. So this is going to be very powerful. And unfortunately, it looks like this is going to make a direct impact on Guam. So they got hurricane warnings in effect there. And if you have family members there, I know this is Military City USA, and you know someone is there, Hopefully uh, they're taking shelter at this point because this is going to be a big, big problem as it moves northwest at about seven miles per hour. Uh, here's the latest track. And yes, it does take it right over Guam and then out over the open Pacific as we get into the latter part of the week. Hopefully there's not a lot of damage there in Guam, but I did want to pass that along. As we go outside for you here locally, 76 degrees, few clouds. Dew point is at 69 south southeasterly winds at about three miles per hour. And the cloud cover well, we don't have a lot here in town. This kind of looks like yesterday with all the clouds out to the west. Uvalde, Hondo, Rock Springs, you are seeing some of those morning clouds. And during the afternoon, we'll see some clouds redevelop. 73 right now in Kerrville, 75 New Braunfels, 74 Gonzales, 75 with lots of sun in Kennedy, but cloudy right now in Uvalde, 72 there. Mid 70s here in San Antonio at this hour. In the case that 12 hour forecast, 83 noon time. We'll be right back into the 80s today, but a little warmer this afternoon, 89 the forecast high and then down into the low 80s this evening with mostly clear skies. Now, as we get into tonight, things do change a little bit. Uh, we'll be watching what develops up here. We talked about this some yesterday, but it's the Texas Panhandle where storms could develop if they form into a cluster, then some of those could work uh, down into our area. There are some showers up around Dallas, but nothing here. And as we look at the forecast, I'm, I'm fast forwarding here to five o'clock this afternoon. Watch these storms out near Lubbock. Watch what they do. They form into a big line or a cluster of storms and they try to work south and southeast. Now, I think the bulk of this probably misses us north. This is at 3 a.m. tomorrow morning, rain along I-35. But we could see the tail end of this, maybe a few showers or storms early, early tomorrow morning. I don't expect a lot of rain and there's a chance that this doesn't even materialize. But uh, we need to point it out. And I think as we get into uh, Wednesday afternoon and again into Thursday morning, we could see a similar setup. So basically, we're going to watch what happens hundreds of miles to our north and west to see how that affects our forecast as we get into the next couple of days. This is midnight Thursday, showing another little system trying to develop. So we'll keep you posted. The Storm Prediction Center does have parts of our area in an isolated risk for severe weather to account for that. Again, the, the risk of seeing storms is low. But it is there. 88 degrees tomorrow, 87 Thursday. We'll put in that 20% chance of rain uh, basically for early Wednesday morning, early Thursday morning. And uh, temperatures stay in the 80s going into the weekend. We'll have another chance for some uh, showers and storms on Memorial Day, guys.
Come on. Another chance for Ray yeah. on Memorial Day. We'd <laughs> like to that. wait for you. This is a uh, three top for lunch, yes, so if, if that's okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, cool. Welcome. Thank, Thank you for not for not standing us up. Uh, 921, 77 degrees. And hearing your child learn how to speak is an exciting moment for parents. And one local teacher is being honored for helping children find their voice. When we come back, I'm going to introduce you to our Educator of the Month and show how she's making learning fun. Educator of the Month, brought to you by And First she loves Mark to Credit see her Union. students progress and change, many starting in a situation from not talking at all to talking at home and at school. Coons Elementary speech language pathologist Lonnie Pope tells us to see this kind of progression in her students is the biggest reward of all. However, the team here at KSED is also recognizing Lonnie as our Educator of the Month. I need you to find a door with a B on it. Can you find a door with a B on it? Mm. Oh, yes. yeah, you found it. It may look like fun and games here for these students at Coons Elementary, but speech language pathologist Lonnie Pope. So who's next? Tells us the lessons behind those games are very important and meant to help each child succeed. I look at each child and usually I'm very game oriented. My kids are enjoying my games over there. I have a, a whole world of games, but games are important because it teaches social interactions. No. No, okay. That's hard to find. All right, King, you're looking for a... Swear. All right, look for the square. Lonnie Pope has been a speech language pathologist at Coons Elementary for 15 years, and she works with students as young as three years old all the way up to fifth grade. My love is kids with autism, but kids with severe disabilities, because I love to see that change when you, it looks like it's never going to happen, and then the kid starts talking. It's just miraculous. And while seeing this change is reward enough for Lonnie, we also surprised her with KSET's Educator of the Month Award. Congratulations. Thank you so much. We work because of the love of what we do, and just how much the reward is. The reward is just priceless with these kids and I don't know I'm so I'm so honored I I'm almost in tears but yes and speechless as a speech pathologist <laughs> she did have us laughing because she said I'm a speech pathologist I don't even know what to say right now and I said we we understand there is a bit of irony yeah here. but congrats yeah a lot of the a lot of the kiddos the ones that were there were you know very excited for her as well well I'm glad you guys got this one in here before the uh, very that's end right. of the school year that's right this is our last one for the school year okay it was a great year 926 77 degrees there's more ahead on GMSA at 9 including how scuba diving has become therapeutic for some veterans and first responders and more about the organization that helps them heal and a guy named Max Massey joins <laughs> us now live in the studio to tell us what he has as coming up next. Yeah, I want to give credit to John and the Koto because he went scuba diving for like seven hours with these veterans. Very impressive. Also impressive. I'm going to give myself a shout out. The story we're doing, a woman getting heart surgery. Instead of having to cut her open, they used a robot and it really saved her life. We're going to hear from her, hear from the doctors. Not going to miss it. We'll be right back. Well, Steph, you missed it yesterday. Uh, we had a big problem. Northeast side, southbound 35 had an accident that backed things up significantly. We're now showing an accident northbound 35. That's at Olympia Hills Parkway out there heading into Selma. We've got an accident that's got at least two lanes closed down. So now big backups northbound 35 in the 1604 area. Second day in a row again northbound instead of southbound, which was yesterday. We'll keep an eye on it for you. CDC reports that in 2021, about 695,000 people in the U.S. died from heart disease. That's one in every five deaths. For more severe cases of heart disease, open heart surgery may be necessary, but what if there were an easier way, a less invasive, less painful, and faster way? Max Massey spoke with one of the first members of our community who received robotic heart surgery. I had pain um, I was already having pain to my neck and I would be driving and I would have just pain right here and then in my back, in my back. So it was, it was shocking. Meet Sandra, a friendly, charismatic and kind woman. Everything seemed under control until she learned a terrifying situation had developed blockage in her artery. At first they couldn't, they didn't exactly know, they just knew I had blockage and they told me that I had a major blockage that was 75. But when they did that first procedure, 
in the latter part of December, it ended up being 90. Sandra learned her artery was 90% blocked. That was the moment everything changed. They told my family, because I was still kind of like knocked out, and that I was a good candidate for the robotic. And they explained it for me. The, the first moments, the first real moments were a shock. I, I cried. It's news no one wants to hear. You have plans and then you get sick and you have the fact of almost losing your life, that you, you might lose your life. But then comes Dr. Ford and Methodist Texan and this Da Vinci robot system. I was crying and emotional upset. The doctors use this robot to potentially save Sandra's life. It's because of the minimally invasive approach. You know, you can go in through the side of the lung between the ribs. You're not having to crack the chest and, and open up the sternum. Sandra is so happy, so optimistic. And she says now, thanks to this revolutionary technology, she can enjoy her new lease on life. You know, I went through a lot of suffering and pain, but I got my life back. It's amazing for Texan and for South Texas, we are the only hospital in the division within Methodist Division that is performing robotic surgeries using the Da Vinci robot. As for Sandra, after surgery just a couple months ago, she's ready to enjoy what she has. Getting out there and enjoying and spending more time with my family, just enjoying life, taking a new vacation. And Max joins us back here live in the studio. Max, how does Sandra feel now? So sitting with her, she was so happy, so excited. And, and I got to say, guys, when you win a Super Bowl or the World Series, you say, what are you going to do now? You're going to go to Disney World. That's exactly what she said. She said she's ready to, to enjoy this new lease on life, go enjoy it with friends and family. A lot of the stuff, I mean, we see, it seems like, you know, daily obstacles are really inconvenient, but when you learn an artery is 90% blocked, it really puts everything into perspective. And she is so excited, like I said, so excited to spend so much more time with her loved ones and enjoy what she now has. And it seems kind of new. What can you tell us about the Da Vinci robot? Well, it, it really is incredible. So this is an example. These are about, about this big. And what it does is it allows the doctor to still do the surgery, but it's almost like a video game. And I don't mean, mean to be flippant about it. I tried this and I'm not gonna lie, I destroyed these. Like it did not go well for me. I'm clearly not a surgeon. The <laughs> Dr. Ford who actually did the procedure and does the procedures here, she is a specialist, 10 years of training. That's her right there. and. Honestly, what they do is amazing. It magnifies multiple times. So as you see right there, they're essentially controlling it remotely using a robot to be as precise as possible. But the coolest thing for me, guys, a personal perspective, I have an aunt that might need open heart surgery. And when I was doing the story, I came to think of her because she might have to have her chest cut open like so many people do to have open heart surgery. But with this, it makes it so easy. They go in through the side. It's minimally invasive. You're out of the hospital within two months and you saw how happy and smiley and able to move that Sandra was. It really is amazing. Max, I know it's a bit of a loaded question, but is this the future of medicine? Well, we, we've already kind of seen this, right? I mean, we've seen such huge advances using the Da Vinci robot in things like colon cancer and prostate cancer. About a decade ago, before this robot and these new mechanisms available to make this so much easier, it was so much more difficult and you never knew what was going to happen. So to answer your question, I think yes. Now, in terms of the, the heart surgery using the Da Vinci, it is a case by case basis. You need to be the right patient, but I'm optimistic that this is gonna be more widespread and this is gonna be able to help a lot more people. Sounds good, Max. Thank you very much. Very, Thanks, very interesting. And I'm sure we'll see a lot more of this in the future. I hope. Thank you, Max. 9.36, let's go outside with live cam. Yeah, uh, still humid, but not as, I feel like it's not as humid as early, early this morning when I stepped out the door. Yeah, the humidity levels will drop off a little bit. And by the way, I checked in on that haze to see if there's any smoke or anything like that. There is a little bit of smoke coming up from Mexico, but nothing that's gonna be a big, big issue today. So air quality is okay. Let's look across the country. Maybe you're doing some traveling this week. There aren't any big storm systems to talk about. You'll notice temperatures are really pretty comfortable. Uh, anywhere you go, the coolest stuff's up there in the Pacific Northwest, 50 in Seattle, 50 in Portland, 52 in Boise. Here in Texas, uh, most of us in the 70s and, well, some 80s along the coast, it's Amarillo that's the cool spot here uh, in the state. 59 right now. That sounds nice. We won't see any of that. 
uh, too humid here to get temperatures like that in the morning hours. But uh, as far as rain goes, a few showers up around Dallas, nothing here. Our rain chances over the next couple of days, though, we do have some chances tonight. Again, Wednesday night, we'll be watching some storms that will develop up to the north and west in the Texas Panhandle. And some of that activity could make its way down here. We'll talk more about that forecast. Plus, uh, today is an anniversary, a sombre anniversary of a flood there in the hill country. We're going to have more on that, too, coming up in just a couple minutes. Justin, thank you to Mark's tomorrow. Rather marks one year since the tragedy at Rob Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. It is special year long project. KSAT 12 spoke with families, survivors, policymakers and people of Uvalde about their loss and recovery. There's always one less plate that I make at dinner. There's always one less child that I wake up for school. One less kid I do homework with, <laughs> you know, just one less laughter and even the little things that were that were irritating just from being a parent and having kids like the noise i used to say yeah calm down there's so many of you and now when it's quiet it's just i would give anything to have that noise back i mean anything we have more to come we'll have live team coverage from uvalde starting tomorrow morning on good morning san antonio leading up to our special one year in Uvalde. It airs at 9 p.m. tomorrow evening right here on KSAT 12. It will also stream on KSAT Plus and our YouTube page. And Rob Elementary School has become known for the shooting there nearly a year ago, but the school had a deep history in Uvalde long before that. There was a contest uh, at the time that the school was being built as to for whom it should be named. My best friend was out there walking and I did not know why. I did not understand. The school issue came up. We took advantage of that. Myra Arthur has a Case That Explains episode on the history of Rob Elementary. You can watch it right now on KSET.com or on our YouTube channel. Time now, 939, 78 degrees. You're watching GMSA at 9. For me, it's knowing how I'm going to come out of the water and how I'm going to be feeling when I'm done. And when we come back, how one organization is helping veterans and first responders heal from their traumas by scuba diving. Back to Transguide real quick. Uh, northbound 35 is still uh, affected due to this accident, FM 1518. According to my map, this is right in front of Ratama Park, the old racetrack out there. Again, northbound lanes, a couple of lanes are closed. Big backups expected. So if you're headed out of San Antonio on 35, heading towards 1604 and Selma, expect delays for the time being. This accident came out at 9.20 this morning, so it hasn't been that long. It looks like they're trying to clear things up. A group of veterans are going to great depths for adventure, happiness, and healing. Hero Scuba Group is a nonprofit organization that is using scuba diving as an alternative therapy for veterans and first responders. He's hatched Jonathan Cotto joined the group of heroes on a dive to the bottom of Canyon Lake where they experienced something they say saves lives. The dive boo is out there. It's an early morning start for this group of scuba divers. The mission of this hero group is to improve the side effects of post-traumatic stress, anxiety and injuries suffered by veterans and first responders. So we started in October 2019 and the vision is just making trying to get other vets and first responders out and available to help with mental health awareness uh, treatment as a treatment option. For many, diving is a recreational sport, a chance at adventure. But for these veterans, descending to great depths is more than just for thrills. It's for healing. For me, it's knowing how I'm going to come out of the water and how I'm going to be feeling when I'm done. Marshall Kaiser is an Army veteran who says Hero Scuba Group is also about the camaraderie. I got out 12 years ago. I missed that. That was that was the the worst part about getting out for me was was not having that anymore. And this group is that for me like it's it's what I what my life was missing and I didn't realize 
how important it was to me. Kaiser's wife has been through the good and the bad in Kaiser's journey and says she has seen how diving has positively impacted his mental health. There's been some research studies done on like, you know, your dopamine and serotonin levels, this natural chemical boost, right? Like if you exercise, you get those natural endorphins. It's almost similar to what they're doing when they dive. Um, and, and you can see it. For more information on how to get involved with the nonprofit organization, head over to our website, kset.com. Reporting Jonathan Cotto, Keysat 12 News. Would you do it? Me? No. <laughs> Absolutely Justin? not. No. No. Oh, you too? Mm -hmm. yeah. You would. You I have. would. Yeah. But Canyon scares me a little bit. I, I love that lake. Yeah. But it gets really deep Very really deep. quick. Very deep. Yeah. yeah. I'm scared. Some brave folks there. Yes. <laughs> In more ways than one. That's, yes, uh, that's very true. true. Very true. Uh, today is uh, sadly an anniversary, guys, that we do need to bring up. Back in 2015, we all remember this, the Blanco River flood that occurred oh, yeah. on this day back in 2015. And I always want to remember this because it's a great reminder, or it is a reminder, that flash flooding happens a lot around here, especially as we get into some of our wet years and we're heading back into an El Nino. So we know that we're going to get some heavy rain along the way. We've got to be so very careful uh, with flooding around here. Was this the one, was this the one that affected uh, Wimberley, Texas? It was. Okay. You're absolutely right. Yes, Wimberley. If you remember the Blanco River, and this is what's uh, pretty wild about this event, went from 5 feet to 41 feet in four hours. The rise was extraordinary. You can see it on the uh, graph here that the river just rose, I mean, just so very quickly. Caught a lot of people off guard. Obviously, it was Memorial Day weekend and the uh, damage was extensive and very sadly we lost 13 lives in that flood so again a reminder here that uh, flooding can happen so quickly around here thankfully it is not in the forecast uh, at least not this week but we know somewhere down the line uh, something like that or at least some heavy rains and flooding could happen again 77 right now at Stinson, 76 Kelly, 75 at Randolph, and we've got light winds and mostly clear skies here in San Antonio. I want to take you out west, though, because clouds here are still holding. Uh, Lakey, Uvalde, Rock Springs, you're still underneath the cloud cover, and that's where temperatures may be held down for a few hours this morning. But once those clouds go away, everyone will be uh, fairly warm. Here around San Antonio, again, skies are clear and temperatures are on their way up. Uh, into the 70s and we'll be in the 80s here pretty soon. Big picture, some showers there around Dallas, Oklahoma City. Nothing major, nothing major, but uh, the forecast does show some storms building this afternoon. This is 5 o'clock, Texas Panhandle. So what happens in Lubbock actually has an effect on our weather down here. We'll see how these storms develop and evolve, but I think that we could get a cluster of storms by, say, 10 p.m. tonight. And the upper level flow will take these south and east. Now, I don't know that they'll build far enough south to have an effect here in San Antonio, but the hill country does need to keep an eye out for this. And this particular model does bring a few showers as far south as San Antonio as this storm system kind of dies down. And then by 4 o'clock tomorrow, there's not much there. But we may do this all again Wednesday night into Thursday morning as more storms develop and kind of a similar pattern here. By the time they get here, probably much, much weaker. And I doubt we're going to get a lot of rain out of this, but it is worth mentioning. And the Storm Prediction Center does have parts of our area at an isolated risk for severe weather. And I think it's pretty low end, honestly, uh, just because everything will be dying down. So we will put in a 20% chance of rain Wednesday morning, Thursday morning. We'll watch what happens with those storms to the north. Otherwise, temperatures are pretty consistent this week in the 80s. And a lot of people are asking about Memorial Day weekend. Well, as it stands right now, I think Saturday and Sunday look pretty quiet. Memorial Day, though, does look to be maybe a little more active. A 20% chance of storms is what we have in the forecast right now. And beyond that, there could be some more chances next week. We'll watch out for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Justin. Yep. 949, 78 degrees. And kids in foster care can continue their education after high school with help financially, but many don't take advantage of those benefits. When we come back, how one student used her foster care waiver at Alamo Colleges and how it's changed her life. Foster kids in Texas can go to any state public college for free, but only half of foster kids take advantage of that benefit. And as our Courtney Friedman tells us, the college with the most students utilizing the waiver in the whole state is right here in San Antonio. 
I got put into foster care at the age of 16. Liz Porak was moved around from family members to shelters and finally a foster family. The ever-changing situation making it hard to plan for her future. For me, I didn't know what school I was going to graduate from. I didn't know what city it was going to be in. She said that's why college was never even something she considered. It was her foster mom who told her about the state's program providing free college tuition waivers to former foster youth. I feel like there's not much awareness on it. That could be why nearly half the state's eligible students don't use it. It shouldn't be rare. It should be something that's more common. Natalie Riojas works for the Alamo Colleges District, which has the largest population of former foster youth in Texas. And each of the campuses has a campus advocate specifically designed to um, walk them through. Riojas oversees the PATH program, which offers former foster youth everything they need to succeed. The PATH program's wraparound services happen right here at the Share Center on campus that includes counseling or help with their classes, but they're also able to come get close here as well as the food pantry. They also make it easy to transfer to other public colleges just like Porak plans to do. Now I'm in my business degree here at Palo Alto but I do want to transfer to a four year to get uh, my cybersecurity. She's interning for the Alamo Colleges helping facilitate resources for students like webinars about financial literacy and mental health. It's definitely giving me more confidence in my voice. A voice she hopes other former foster youth will find too by using their free tuition waivers. Don't be scared of your future and take advantage. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. And there is an age cap for these tuition waivers. Students have to register before they're 25 to receive that free education. But anyone interested in learning more can contact the Alamo Colleges District. You still have time to donate a shoebox of essentials for those in need. The United Way of San Antonio and Bear County Shoebox Project hopes to collect 10,000 shoeboxes full of essentials. They will be donated to people in need here in San Antonio. Now, the drive ends on Friday. We have all the information about how you can help on ksat.com in our KSAT community section. And a look at the Rosewood Trans Guy. Looks like things are a little better out there at I-35 at Olympia. Things are moving. You said the accident has cleared. Right? It sure looks like it has. Yeah. I mean, there's a few vehicles on the shoulder and somebody's standing out there too. But it looks like all the lanes are slowly reopening. But expect some backups in that area far northeast side. Northbound 35 near Rotama Park. And we're uh, closing in on 80 degrees already. It's warm and humid out there. We'll be up around 89 this afternoon. Keep in mind that 89 is going to feel more like 93, 94 when you factor in the humidity. We will watch for some storms later tonight. Next couple of nights, we could see some of those complexes of storms drifting close to us, but I wouldn't bet on any great rain chance. Hey, folks, just a heads up. If you're on the south side, San Antonio police are going to be conducting training detonations today with their bomb squad unit. It will be from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. at SAPD's training Ac academy. That is near 410 and Morrison Boulevard. So don't be alarmed if you hear loud noises in that area. We just wanted to let you know that happens from now and then, that yeah, kind of training. Yeah, so just to let you know, don't be worried. We'll see you tomorrow. Have a good day.